whereabouts are you today? I'm in Berkeley, California, and it's uh, wonderfully gloomy and rainy and uh, a good day to be inside talking on the talking on the Zoom. So. Yeah, there you go. It's 9.30 in the morning here on a Monday morning in Auckland, so <laughs> sun crazy. is out. <laughs> Amazing, and you're uh, you're in a much safer part of the world than I am. Uh, well, it feels that way. Yeah, I'm I'm happy to be here. That's for sure. Uh, yeah. How are things over there these days? Well, in my particular neck of the what my my micro zip code, people are pretty careful and pretty good. But the Bay Area itself is in is raging and in bad shape, and we're in lockdown number two. So right. this right. is about as much as I'm allowed to do is go into my backyard shed and. Talk on the talk on the phone. So <laughs> Man, it, it's got to be frustrating. Uh, and I was just looking at like the headlines and seeing or there was like some big uprising or hubbub in Washington. And yeah, yeah, no, it's uh, you know it's funny. People talk about the radical left, but uh, the left is looking more and more like constitutionalists every day here. It's, it's true. The <laughs> right wants to set everything on fire and start again. So well, I assume. I mean, you know, cynically, I assume the interests of big business will prevail and will avoid real conflict. But uh, that's usually the way it goes. Maybe I shouldn't be uh, so cavalier (laughs) about it at this point. I mean, I live in a zip code where Trump got like 3% of the vote. So we're kind of monochromatic in our political views here. So, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, so you've got your album coming out this weekend, I believe, or this Friday, right? How are you feeling yeah, about me it? Yeah, Paul McCartney. He was, uh, I feel bad stealing his thunder, but uh, he was cool about it. We had I chatted with his management <laughs> and he could share some space. So. <laughs> That's the McCartney 3 album, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I haven't, I haven't heard anything from it, but it's been on total lockdown. I'll, I'll be interested to check it out. Yep, so. yep. I'm sure we'll all be talking about it when it gets to that time. But let's talk about your album instead. <laughs> so it's called what, River Run? It's called River Run. I, I stole it. It's the first word in uh, James Joyce's Finnegan's Wake. Um, when I, and I had taken a Joyce class in college and uh, I burned out after Ulysses. I tried Finnegan's Wake and couldn't, I couldn't make any sense of it. But I just thought that, I just thought as a word, it was really evocative. And because the record is an attempt to, to really uh, look at a whole life from childhood to the present day, I thought the image of you know, the river running through it and this kind of inexorable passage of time was a good, it was just a good title for, for what I was trying to communicate, so. Cool, and so this is your debut album, but you're a veteran musician. You've been doing like session work and playing with other people and a lot, so. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm like the guy you sort of recognize, three steps to the left of the person you came to see. If you're in the <laughs> Bay Area, if you're if you go out to see shows in the Bay Area, you've seen me at least once. I've just right. been kind of a, a jack of all trades for dozens of bands, and it kind of became I have kind of two arcs. Like I got there in the mid '90s and was playing with a bunch of people, and then I stepped away for a while. And then a good friend of mine got a a major label deal, and so I I took time off from work and I went all in, and we spent a year and a half pushing. When I came back from that, I wanted to find a middle ground between my regular life, which is teaching, and then still playing. So a friend of mine and I started something called the San Francisco Songwriters Coalition, and we hosted these Thursday night concerts. And through that, I met, you know, hundreds of musicians and just have kept that going. So for the last 14 or 15 years, I've been playing in bands, playing on other people's records. And I got to I got to 2019 and I was going to turn 50 and uh, I was really excited about making some art. And I realized all the projects that were in were writing, were tweeners. Like they had just come off the road or they were writing or they were going to try, they were, they were scaling back. And so I just thought, I mean, this is a sign. Like it's time for me to go to the drawer where I keep all the half finished or songs that I just write for myself and see if there was something there. And then that, that spurred me to write 10 or 15 new ones and the kind of, and then once I had the idea of what I wanted to do, I was able to kind of slot the right songs in the right space, and it turned into a, turned into a debut record. So I'm an right. accidental solo artist, like a quarter century into the into the life of being a musician. So. <laughs> Very good. And I'm uh, I'm assuming that some of these songs are biographical or autobiographical, and that Florida is, uh, is possibly where you're from originally. So oh, yeah, uh, kind of yes and kind of no. So my uh, my mom's from Florida and we would go down there three or four times a year and usually for the entire summer. So I had like, 
And we lived there until I was about five or six. So I think of Florida as this childhood space. Right. And, um, and you actually said it right. The songs are autobiographical, like some of it's me and some of it's people I know. And I, I definitely have smushed some things together and uh, changed some names and dates to protect the innocent and further <laughs> indict the guilty. But yeah, so the side one is, is set in Florida purposefully, because when I think of when I think of my my childhood, I, I tend to go there, even though I spent a lot of time in, in uh, Maryland as well. Um, right. And then the record, like it's in, I think it's it's a four part old fashioned 65 minute double record. Right. I had like Blonde and Blonde and London Calling as the as the parameters. So side one is childhood. Side two is adolescence. Ah. Side three is early adulthood. And you know, making the first really big mistakes that you make where the consequences are permanent. And then side four is kind of figuring it out and making peace and and figuring out a, a version of yourself that you and other people can live with. So that that's really what I tried to do with the four sets of the record. But you're right, the side one is is uh, oriented specifically in, in, you know, zero to 15, 16 kind of. Right, right. So. And speaking of Florida, the first song on the album is called Florida. And it's it's pretty, pretty ominous sounding and kind of pretty heavy. <laughs> Is, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah the, um, I mean, I tried to, because I was doing a whole, like a person's life, I wanted to, to vary the styles of the songs as much as I could while still like so sounding like something that I could do or that was felt authentic to me. So Florida is definitely a, a deliberate attempt to have a swampy sound. Uh, my friend, James DePredo, who's Chuck Prophet's lead guitar player. I think you, oh, you talked yeah. to Chuck recently, right? So he's, he and I played together for almost 20 years. And so I asked him to get out, you know, to do his swampy slidey best. And he really, the track was working. And then when he put all the slide on the top, it just became this kind of swampy thing. And it's very, it's very um, dark Tom Petty-ish on purpose. Like Tom Petty and I were born in the same town, actually born in the same hospital, like, 15 years apart and he's always been a touchstone for me like he's he he was 15 years older than I was so every time he put a record out I felt like he was warning me about what was coming next you know? <laughs> right <laughs> when I listened to wildflowers when it came out I was like oh that's what I gotta prepare for in my 40s like those are the yeah those are the, the kind of warning potholes if I that I gotta try to avoid which I didn't but what are you gonna do but so that's <laughs> that song's deliberately evocative of like a kind of everglady swampy part of Florida. But then the record has these other deliberate, like, you know, it, out of here is very much an attempt to do like a SST Husker du punk thing. I've got yep, yep. Uh, kind of some talking headsy early eighties sounds. There's a, there's definitely like a police ish ska thing going on. There's some Elvis Costello in there. And, and I wasn't, I was trying to ride the line between um, imitation and full ripoff and and I that's when I gave it to friends when I had rough mixes I was like if anything's if if your immediate reaction is you just ripped off x you have to tell me because I'm yanking it so I got a lot of really great editing feedback after the first set of roughs from my music buddies they were wonderfully uh real with me and so some of the some of the changes I made from when I thought I was done to what I actually done really made the record sound more like me and le right. less like a jukebox so I'm really grateful for that cool cool and I know you play most of the instruments on the album. Like you mentioned, you had a couple of friends who help out. Was that by choice or necessity because of COVID and all that stuff? Oh, yeah. You know, it's not really a COVID record. I started in January and actually COVID interrupted it because I was right. really on a roll. And March 13th, I was in the studio with my friend Gowan, who recorded and engineered the whole thing for me. And we got on our phones like, you got to go home right now. Like, go, you know, this the first shutdown was like a red alert. So we had to take six weeks off. Um, and then once we, you know, we could go back, like we were masked and, but no, it was deliberate. I wanted to play all the instruments myself because I had been playing for other people. You know, I've, right. I've been in the studio for the last 20 years. I've been the guy who plays a part and then a producer asks me to edit, make changes. The artist will have an opinion. I'm really trying to bring somebody else's vision to bear. And my job's to play what they hear, not to play what I hear. And I wanted to see what would happen if I just followed my own nose, right? So I, I played everything except um, the lead guitar parts I, I really couldn't play myself. Like they were just too complicated or, or like I also knew that James would, James would hear things I couldn't. Like I, I knew when I started that I was gonna ask James to 
to just have an open palette. Like I, I literally just gave him the song and said, do whatever you hear. And I, I think there was only one song where I had him do a second, a second try. Everything he brought back was, was better right. than what I had been imagining. So he, that was the, the closest collaboration, but the rest was really me trying to, to bring the whole, what I heard in my head onto the, the plus, I mean, everybody's a frustrated drummer who wouldn't want to, book studio time and get to drum their own material like you know I, that was definitely the the first day when i put the drums down for the first song i was like oh this is going to be fun <laughs> so, yeah well you mentioned paul mccartney he was he's the classic example of frustrated drummer <laughs> yeah no kidding absolutely yeah um one song i wanted to touch on was breathe it out again which is later in the record and um it's it sounds is it is is it, is it uh, biographical? Is it based on fact? There's a girl in this photo with the dad over her shoulder who dies two weeks later. Stupid mistake, learned a second too late that turns her god into a traitor. They teach a joke in school, but it doesn't help figure out a mom who's lost in grief. Like, yeah, a friend of mine uh, uh, from childhood lost uh, lost her dad really early, and um, there's a you know Facebook throws up photographs, and a photograph came up of him, um, and it just hit me like a it just was one of those moments where like it just hit me like a truck, like how difficult that must have been. Yeah. And so I I was imagining that that character, and then I mean it's not straight biography. It just the the photograph was the first image and then I just kind of followed it other than that but that right now that's my favorite on the record I'm glad that jumped out of you too like there's and there's that's an attempt to kind of go all kitchen sink like I it has this ridiculous drum start it's got the piano breakdown in the middle like I was trying to um kind of get everything every kind of everything that in my own playing at these other instruments into a track so if I had to if somebody was like, just give me the one that tells me the most about the record. Right now, I feel like that might be the one that does it. But, it, you know, it's five and a half minutes long and it's kind of ridiculously ambitious. So it's also not the right one to like, here, ch check it out. I mean, right. So. Well, it depends on who you're talking to, I guess. <laughs> That's true, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, and I see you made a video for the song Kiss Me, which uh, is your pretty much typical COVID variety video yeah. with. Uh, you obviously put it together all by yourself with uh, playing all. Like that? I have a great face for radio, so yeah. I'm trying to keep the videos really, really simple, you know? So, yeah, my friend Jerry just uh, has, a, has a studio space, and, and we went in and just and got it, you know, in, a, in like two hours. I, I'm not a, um, you know, I don't want to do the, the Billy Squire thing where you, you think you're a video artist, and the next thing you know, you've killed your career before it's even gotten started. <laughs> and so I'm, I'm going to keep, at the same time, I, you know, I'm learning in this moment where I can't just go play 50 shows to, uh, right. how to, how to get myself out there. So yeah, I'm going to, I have a couple of other ideas in mind for videos. I think I've got a good idea for how to, um, parody Dylan's subterranean homesick video with the placards. I think oh, yeah, I can yeah, do yeah, that yeah. in the backyard. So I'm, but yeah, it was fun to do. I mean, you know, the, um, it, I, I'm not a great uh, lip syncer. I don't want to spoil it earlier, but those, that's not me actually playing the parts, America. Right. But, uh, but it was fun to do. And, and uh, I think if I can figure out ways to keep it simple and, uh, and keep the music up front, then um, I'll, keep, yeah. I'll keep at it, you know. So are you thinking about performing live at some point? And, and Absolutely. Yeah, I'm in a Friday night um, Zoom hang with a bunch of local musicians. Um, and uh, they've been really generous. They've already kind of identified themselves as the band. So right, right. I've got the group and uh, we just need the green light. But um, without question, I mean, we'll get at least we'll get at least one big show in in uh, 2020 when we're allowed to. But, you know, they're all 
they're all full-time professional musicians themselves. So, you know, they, they've got their own, you know, they, it, it's watching them go through this has been really, really sobering and challenging. You know, I still have my, my teaching day job and, uh, right. you know, but they're the pressure that they're under. So I'm actually eager to, to get a gig so that I can get them back in front doing back, being in front of people playing, which is what they're best at and what yeah. they should be doing. So. Uh, I'd be curious to see if a, how a Florida audience would uh, react to the, the line of Florida smells like a root beer can left out in the sun. <laughs> you know, I, I, what are you going to do? You know, I, I, it's so funny, like, um, a lot of people are like, why a root beer can? And it really, I thought about it, you know, people are like, isn't it just a beer can? And it's not, right? Like a beer can would be a little bit too promising. Like it's that sticky, syrupy, yeah, I just yeah. remember every summer getting up and having to shake my sneakers because one time out of five there'd be a two foot cockroach hiding in it like my florida childhood is is is, is not the florida of today it's not disney world florida right i mean right. it's like it's swampy and it's it's you know it's not quite deliverance, but it's much more deliverance than it is Magic Kingdom. And so, like, I, you know, <laughs> that's, that's that's what it's that's what it felt like to me. So I'm sticking by my story there. Very good, very. And of course, you get your hurricanes blowing in, uh, right. in right, on a regular basis, which just sh shakes it up a, a bit. Yeah. <laughs> um, another song uh, um, I, on music that I've forgotten. Uh, is there a cello in there somewhere? Yeah, there is. Um, that's actually, I had this idea that that was that song was going to take me a long time. Like it's it's a pretty it's it's a pretty soft, picky guitar part, and like we were really close mic'd on it. And I decided to play upright bass, and uh, um, and you know I I had in my head all this orchestration, and we were going to put some other things on there. And then we recorded just the bass and the acoustic guitar, and, and Gowan, to his credit, was like, "You're you're done here. Like I'm going to put right. a little." I'm gonna put a little angelic sweetening in the background of the second verse, but like, let's keep it really silent and stripped down. And so we went from like, I had charted like kind of a string quartet and we went down to just the cello and uh, uh, it, I, I'm really happy with how it turned out. That one is, I, it's so funny, like that one is either everybody's favorite or the one where they're like, dude, what are you doing? There's that breakdown where the, the, the I do the Parisian band in the subway and kind of- right, right. right. A little bit. It's, it's definitely a love hate moment. You're either going to be like, oh, that's super cool, or you're just going to raise the <laughs> air. You know, you, why not? If you're going to make a big, long, silly concept record, you got to have at least one or two, you know, swing hard at a pitch moments. That's definitely one of them. So, right, right. And, and there is a line in there that kind of makes you think that it was written in COVID era times with the mask and the kissing and the. No, oh, yeah, that's true. I hadn't thought of that. That's actually one of the oldest songs on the record. You know, there's seven brand new ones and then six from the kind of drawer. And that one's, that's one of my oldest songs. And, you know, it's one of those ones where I wrote it. I performed it a few times. I knew it was good, but um, I could never really lean into it because it's, you know, it's pretty raw and it's, you know, I feel pretty exposed when I, when I sing it. So yeah, uh, I, I waited to do it. Like I recorded like seven or eight of the record. I waited until I knew the record was going to work and I was going to finish something before I even brought it in because I, I thought if I tried that one too early and I fell on my face, I might I might lose my mojo for the whole project. But, yeah. but you're so right. I'm glad that it, it, I'm glad it feels fresh because you know for me it it feels uh, for me it's an old soul. But <laughs> no, no, it sounds like it was written a couple of months ago, maybe. <laughs> so. Cool. Cool. So you mentioned you're a teacher. Do you teach music? I do. I, I, I'm a literature teacher. And then I also teach a, a course in rock history and performance. So ah. it's uh, everyone who's in it is a musician. But we do. It's like half music history and half performance. So um, right now we're studying, you know, the mid 1970s. I actually I saw that um, your top three records of all time. You'll be glad to know I did a whole week on horses. We read, uh, oh my god, read, uh, <laughs> three fourths of just kids, and we broke down the whole record. And, and Fantastic. Uh, I, used it, I used it as kind of a, you know, I try to do these kind of seminal records, and so horses was. Uh, I agree with you is one of the big turning points in the the seventies. So yep, yep, yep. Good stuff. Uh, and are the are your students mostly kind of? university age oh no no it's not high school so they're like uh Even better 16 17 yeah so they're it's funny like they uh 
they run the gamut in their tastes. Like I've got kids in there who are all about the, the immediate moment and they're all Freddie Gibbs. And, uh, and then I've got these kids who are just all, it's all Pink Floyd, Led Zeppelin, Allman Brothers. Like they just feel out of time and, you know, born in the wrong era. And then to watch them find common ground with each other and learn how to play together is pretty, uh, is pretty Yeah, cool. it's weird about, you know, feeling like you were born in the wrong era. Like I was, um, a uh, teenager in the early 70s and I I fell in love with 50s music so I felt like oh man I wanted to see Chuck Berry and Little Richard and doo-wop music and all this you know and all this great stuff Bowie and all this stuff was going on at the same time <laughs> and you're still it's feeling funny. like you're missing out I kind of had the same thing too like you know that you know you're in your moment and you're also kind of looking back like it must have been but I think that's if, if your teenage years feel exactly how they're supposed to feel, you're probably doing something wrong. You're peaking too early. Like, if you're a teenager and you're not looking back, like, surely it was better than this at some point, you might, right. you might, uh, you might be doing it wrong. So, peaking too early. No, I'm, I can't yeah. say that. <laughs> yeah, I can't say that. I definitely, I'm not guilty of peaking in my teenage years. There's no right, question. right. So, so I assume you're 51 now. You, you yeah, 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 that's right. And, so and gotta, how does it feel to be one years old and put out your debut album? I mean, is it just, you just do it? Yeah, I mean, it's funny, right? Like I, uh, either, I, I, there was either you like fudge it, right? You're like, oh, I'm a veteran, but I'm young at heart. But like, I mean, <laughs> I just lean it all into it. Like, and I'm like, you know, I'm a pretty young 50. Like I'm, I'm in, I'm, I feel, I still feel like a kid in a lot of ways. Yeah. I'm still like surprised when I, when people treat me like I'm an adult, you know, when I'm out and people call me sir, or like they defer to me. I'm like, what are you doing? Yeah. You know? So I, I, I haven't quite made that adjustment, but I, you know, it's also just, you know, if I have 35 years of playing live, like I've played thousands of live shows, I've been on hundreds of records, like there's something about that, that uh, that's my calling card, right? Is that right. I'm not, I'm not at a point of discovering my love for music. Like I'm so deep in it. It's so entwined with my DNA. Like I can't imagine a day without it. And so yep. the record is my, the record is a lifetime's worth of learning. Right. I mean, that's the way I'm kind of thinking about it. It's like, yeah, it's a debut record, but it, it's not a, it's not a guy who just picked up a guitar and figured out four chords and, right. and has things to say. Like it's, it's coming from a place of like, I, when I write a song, like I, I know the other 150 songs who I'm, who I'm bumping up against. And then I'm really trying to do something in it that adds to the canon or like is a yes and or, or adds a little bit more to that, what those songs were trying to say or, or offer. So, yeah, yeah. so I'm just, I'm just gonna, you know, I, I, and I mean, I'm, I'm a good player. I'm a terrible self promoter. We're just gonna have to see how it goes, but like it, <laughs> it took me a long time to put this out and, uh, and I'm committed to doing anything and everything I can to getting it heard. And the other thing about being my age, like what I want most from this is just, I hope it can get off the island. I feel like Tom Hanks in Castaway, right? Like right, right. I can get the record inside the wave break. Like I've got a community here who will check it out and let me know yeah. what they think. Getting it over that, yep. getting it over that wave and getting it out into the random world. That's, that's the dream. And if I yep. can, if, I can get people to hear it and engage with it, then everything else is gravy. So. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, I think that's the thing that everybody kind of deals with, especially with social media, Facebook. You have your group of friends, whether they're a few hundred or thousand or whatever, and you feel like, okay, this is happening, but then you realize it, it's a bubble and you need to break yeah. that bubble and get out into the rest of the, and that's the hard part, I guess. But. Well, that's why you're such a, a valuable addition to the team, Marty. I can't thank you enough for uh, reaching out. So, Have you ever been to New Zealand? I haven't. We have good friends who um, used to live here who have moved back home. They were they were from there originally. But um, I'm a... Uh, I mean, we we really looked at it when, uh, when we saw how you guys handled COVID. We called them up like, hey, what's up to me about teaching jobs in New Zealand, but uh, yeah, I promise if we ever get to New Zealand and I have a gig, I will play um, all the way from Memphis. From <laughs> Thank you. That's all I can I, ask I, for. <laughs> done and done. I, I, uh, I've got that locked in for sure. So. Fantastic. Well, that's something to look forward to. Uh, yes. <laughs> All righty. Well, thank you for talking to me now. Good luck with the record. And hopefully it's not going to be another 50 years till the next one. You know, you know how it is. Like once you start, like I've already got three or four other ones and there were two or three from the old drawer that I were impossible to cut. So yeah, I'm, I have a good start on the next one, but I'm going to, 
going to spend 2021 trying to get this guy around and and in the semi consciousness of people. So we'll see. <laughs> very good. Well, good luck with it all. Hopefully, we'll see you sometime in the Thanks, near future. 